Welcome back to another special edition of Why Blank Lost, as we continue our series of Why Blank One podcasts in parallel with the RHAP Survivor Season Rankings. I'm David Bloomberg, and I'm joined, of course, by my co-host, Jessica Lewis. Hello again, and thank you everyone for joining us and coming back on this journey through time. This is quite exciting, and I must say, I'm happy we did the rewatch because I was less impressed with this season than I was the first time I watched it. So this will be fun to talk about. Yeah, I think that uh, on the main podcast, um, uh, Taryn and company were talking about how it is less interesting when you know what's going to happen. Yeah, and I feel like certain seasons, though, on the rewatch, I've still been excited because mm -hmm. it's like I've forgotten, oh, this was a great season, or I forgot about this moment. And this season, I think in my head, I had remembered it as being awesome. And then I was watching it going, not so awesome. So it's it's interesting that that was the, the approach I took this time. Well, maybe the season wasn't awesome, although, you know, it did rank obviously higher than anything else we've talked about so far. And that's true. Um, and, and of course, we are here, in case anyone, you know, didn't know this, we're here to discuss Survivor Cook Islands and specifically why you will won. Mm -hmm. Um as we've discussed before, we're focusing on two groups of winners in these podcasts, those who make us wonder how they won and those who did such a good job that we think they're awesome and it's worth discussing them. Uh, obviously, we picked this one because Yule is in that second group, uh, which is yes. no surprise. Um, it, it, it's no surprise to anyone because Yule was another player who told me in his post-game interview that he read all my articles on Reality News Online. There you so, go. Obviously. Very mm -hmm. smart guy. He's even more awesome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and also, I had not remembered, I predicted Yule would win <gasps> in my pregame picks. Did you really? Now, here's the thing, though. There were five of us on the website predicting who would win. Mm -hmm. Four of us independently picked Yule. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> Well, I, listen, if you if you read anything about this guy, he's like Superman. I mean, yeah. it's just ridiculous. So, yes, it would make sense to read all of that and to see what he has accomplished in life to say, yeah, that guy's going to win. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who the uh, the fifth person was. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't call them out here. Actually, I probably would. I should have checked that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Uh, so um, but all that said, I think there's another reason that you wanted to watch this season. And that was so that we could discuss Ozzy and his social media accounts again. <laughs> Listen, he gave us some props for putting that out there for him. So again, well, you're welcome. He put Ozzie. it out there. He was well, the one who put it out there. He did. Uh, <laughs> and then we just brought it to our listeners attention that might yes. not have otherwise known of Ozzy's current social media platform yes yes and i was told we probably should have warned people not to check out his um main twitter page unless you were prepared <laughs> for x-rated content right there yeah uh, yeah so yeah i did actually share that with my husband later we were chatting mm -hmm. about it and i explained it to him and then i said see and i just <laughs> yeah and he was like oh wow okay that's like everything yeah yes. it's literally everything so yeah. that's your warning if you do check, be prepared. No mm -hmm. children in the room. <laughs> There's a lot there. Yeah. Yes, there is. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that's, you know, that's the real reason I think you did it. But uh, uh, no, but mm -hmm. thanks for the reminder. Sure. Sure. Um, anyway, uh, to figure out why you will won. Uh, we will follow the same path we always do during the normal Survivor seasons, which is comparing how he played to the rules I originally wrote way back after season one. And of course, we will look at Ozzy, and not that way. Uh, we will look at Ozzy's game and a little bit of Becky's play uh, as necessary to see how their actions may have contributed to the win for Yule. Mm -hmm. Anyone who would like to refamiliarize themselves with the rules can check the most recent version at robhaswebsite.com slash blog slash survivor rules. Mm -hmm. Or you can get the shorter and much more colorful uh, version of the rules in poster form. I tried uh, to do it the right way and I did it the yes, wrong way. Yes. Uh, and that is at, of course, tinyurl.com slash David Rules Poster 2. And I will say there is another way that you could get twice your money's worth. No and way. that is 
I know. Right? Ready for this? Because the poster is twenty dollars, right? So if mm -hmm. you want the poster, it's twenty dollars plus shipping and handling. However, if you would like to have a conversation with myself, if you enjoy listening to me, I don't know. Maybe you want to talk to me. It would be great. You can actually go on eBay and there's an auction with Give Kids the World and my Zoom call is there. And as an added bonus, I will be giving the winner one of the posters. So hey. not only do you get a conversation with me, you will also receive a poster and uh, start bidding. Somebody has bid, so people get in there. Let's raise some money for the kids. And in the meantime, you can have a conversation with me, get a poster. It's all good. Winners all around. That's right. That's right. Now, do you know off the top of your head when the auction ends? Uh, in like two days and like five hours or something. Uh, yeah, but we so. don't know when this is going to be posted. So, Oh, that's true. So um, it might like, be done by the time you hear this. Damn it. <laughs> mm. Can you extend it? Uh, that's probably not fair to people. but uh, It's not fair. Um, but anyway, so that was out there. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it'll still be by the time you hear this. You can, we'll forgive you if you pause this video or podcast, run to eBay, bid, and right. then come back. Check it out. Come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and be careful or I might outbid everyone for a chance to talk to you. I know. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> <laughs> and you could win a poster. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. It's like the it's like two things you've never experienced. That's before. right. That's right. It's so insane. <laughs> so um also speaking of the poster, well, uh, we were speaking of the poster, but there's another way to get the rules so you can have them with you, and that of course is in t-shirt form. Mm -hmm. Uh, the t-shirt is not part of the auction, unfortunately, no. uh, but it is uh, at robhasawebsite.com or robhasapodcast.com. Click the merch link near the top, uh, and then you can scroll scroll through, or the other thing you can do is you can like select apparel, uh, men's t-shirts, women's t-shirts, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, and you'll find not just that design, but another design as well, a checklist design. And... Uh, so, and then the checklist design, you can even get on a mug. So you can choose mugs and order that. So get it everywhere, uh, yeah, all around your all house. All these options that you have. Decorate the walls, wear it on yourself, drink it yes. when you're having your coffee. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm moving my son to a new apartment soon, and that's all I'm contributing for decoration <laughs> is posters <laughs> and mugs and shirts. And that's amazing. I love it. So, um, now, we've already chatted a little bit about some of the season, but before we get to the rules, there are always some things that we want to mention. Um, now, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, so a couple podcasts ago, I mentioned the Secret Society of Survivor Jessicas. Mm -hmm. um, and we once again have a Jessica who goes by a nickname. Yeah. So I have to wonder, if they needed you to go by a nickname on your season instead of having Figgy do it, what nickname would you have been? I love this question because I actually had it all planned out. Oh, wow. I did because, I, and it's this is an association to my job. Uh, we do a lot of like. I don't think they could say that on TV. What do you mean? <laughs> I was just thinking what your employees probably call you. That's oh, what. well, it's, <laughs> listen. All right. Let me explain. Okay. Uh, some of us go by our initials. And okay. so my initials at work are JBL mm -hmm. and, and I, I just think it, it's great. I really liked it. You know, that mm -hmm. it just sounded cool. JBL was neat. And then also I actually have t-shirts and a hat that have JBL because of the stereo system that is JBL. Oh, okay. Right. So it was like, I could not only have like my name be JBL, but I could also have a t-shirt that says JBL and that would be really great marketing. It would be awesome. But then I was like, no, I want to try to keep that world separate. So I mm -hmm. actually went by Jessica, which it doesn't appear any Jessica other than me. And maybe I'm wrong goes by Jessica when they play survivor. So I guess I made the right choice. Oh, there's know. at least one. There's at least, Is there at least uh, one. Yeah. There's at least one or two, I think. Um, so but yes, it's um, very interesting. Yeah. Plus, the other thing is Survivor would have probably never let you wear something with a I know, logo and, unless they were getting paid for it. And so. that's the other concern, too, that it, it never would have happened. But the yeah. JBL was fun. Just the thought of it was nice. But it didn't happen. And yeah. might I men just mention, I would like for the rest of this podcast to refer to Ozzy as Oscar. Yeah, I know. Oscar. <laughs> Oscar. 
I was like, Oscar, who's Oscar? I forgot his name was Oscar. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it came up and I was like, wait. I think Parvati <laughs> called him Oscar like the whole season. And she wrote down when she yeah. voted, she voted for Oscar. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, I forgot his name is Oscar. Yeah. So just, you know, saying. Yeah. I'm not going to remember to call him that. Uh, but the weirder thing is that they called Penner Jonathan. I know they did, too. You know, yeah. I looked back at all my articles and they said, Jonathan, this and Jonathan, that. And I'm like, Jonathan. Oh, Penner. Penner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Penner, it was great to see his wife, Stacy, yes. in the family visit. That was um, so and it was so amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then this everybody, this is why I'm wearing this shirt, because mm. oops, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah. And, you know, she even played a role, you know, because she came up with the idea to wring water out of her hair and clothes. And let me just say, Jeff Probe, stop talking. Can you like, yes. I really oh appreciate God. him so much, but he was the one who pointed out she was doing that. And then Parvati started, you know, then mm -hmm. and it kind of like moved down the line. Other people started doing it. Like, can you not give people secrets away? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, they're doing it this way. Shut right. up, Jeff. Yeah. Like, stop it. Stop it. Shh. Just shh, quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm, he doesn't. Yeah. And then they came so close to winning, and instead, mm -hmm. he gets sent to Exile Island. I know. Um, so it was a very bittersweet moment. Um, yeah. So Nice to see her just in yes. the way that she was, and it was right. beautiful, really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, moving from that to a part that was just bitter and not sweet at all, was the final four fire making. Oh. <laughs> because. Yeah. JBL. It was <laughs> it was so exciting. That was I can I can absolutely see oh, why God. Jeff Probst would want that on every season. Oh my God. What was so horrifying about this moment? I remembered what happened and my husband was watching it with me and it kind of all starts and I was like, this is awful. And Aaron's like, why? What happens? I'm like, do you want me to spoil it for you? Do you want to just watch it? He's like, no, no, I'll watch it. I'm like, all right, well, it's really, it's really embarrassing. It's terrible. And he was just shocked. He was absolutely shocked. And then they brought out matches and he it was like, whoa, wait. And I'm like, watch, it gets better. <laughs> and then they couldn't start a fire with matches either. It was so bad. That was yeah. terrible. Yeah. yeah. And there was a lot, obviously, we didn't see since it went on for an hour and a freaking half. I know. Um, and the thing is, the two of them, since they were so close, when Sundra ran out of husks, Becky told me that she gave her some. Oh, my God. You know, you're you're fighting for your place in the game and you're helping your friend. And yeah. then, of course, Sundra ran out of matches and suggested that uh, they should do rock, paper, scissors. Um, but they just continued. And, and well, OK, one of them continued. Yeah, and, it was, you know, that was bad. They both insisted that they had started fire all season long and that it was the wind or the material or the nerves or but they weren't actually doing it the way that you were supposed to do it I, yeah so if they had they they couldn't have been starting fires well the entire time well the other thing i and i can't remember where i saw or heard this um something like they gave them a different type of flint than they were used to using i don't know hmm, but, i don't know either but, but I, it's it just was, Listen, to any survivor wannabes out there, you go onto eBay and you order yourself some flint before you go out there mm -hmm. and you practice in your backyard or your balcony or your kitchen, wherever you can. And you you try to use the same type of metal material with and just try it because you're going to have to know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially nowadays. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, Jeff. Super exciting. That was um, awful. Let's put that in every season. I do um, like, though, I just gave Jeff some, you know, guff for saying too much. But I do appreciate the fact that he reminded everyone that after 38 days, you should know how to make fire. Yes. Yes. That was nice. Yeah. Little so. like dig at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He liked making digs this season. He Usually did. Usually at Yule. But. Uh, yeah. No. Um, well, every once in a while, Jeff says things and you're like, hmm, that was a little harsh. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll get to a couple places where it was very wrong also. Mm. Uh, 
but uh, it, anyway, after Becky won the fire making, or at least failed to lose the fire making, I guess, uh, she went on to create a place for herself in Survivor history, uh, probably one she didn't want. Uh, and that was the first finalist to ever receive zero votes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, now, we've discussed over the sev past several podcasts that um, it's very common for the third place person to get zero votes. And she was, of course, the first three person final uh, to face the jury. But still, got a sting. Oh, it has to. I mean, and the whole thing, and obviously we will talk about her game and, and the things that she could have done differently, well, but some. <laughs> a little bit, but it, but it is one of those things that I think that the first time something happens in Survivor is probably always one of the more difficult times for it to happen because mm -hmm. you've never seen it before. And I think a lot of people that go on and play Survivor are people that have seen the show, at least we hope, and they have some idea of what they're going to be dealing with and what's going to be happening and to have that happen was like oh this is great there's going to be three of us and then oh this is not great because i didn't get any votes yeah. yeah yeah now i will say that just as we uh talked about in winners at war there were some jurors who wanted michelle to get second place but they didn't feel like they could vote for her because it would risk tony not getting first place mm -hmm. uh the same may have been true in cook islands according to becky she told me she believed that she would have gotten a couple of votes from people if those jurors hadn't been worried that it would mean ozzy would win instead of yule mm, interesting so um but uh and they're right you know i mean if they had been one vote difference well yeah if they were going to have the tiebreaker the same way, if they're then, it, you know, we know who Becky would have given the win right. to. So yeah. it would have had to be two votes difference. But right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, all that said, is there anything else about the season that you want to discuss before we get to the rules? Well, I don't appreciate the way in which the jury was formulated in this season. And I know that they've okay. done this maybe in one other season, maybe two where the person is put on to the jury before the merge happens. Oh, and it's been, I think it's been more than a couple seasons. I, see, I don't yeah. feel like it's that regular, but I never like it when they do it. Oh, and no, I, I agree with you. Yeah. And so I saw this and I was reminded how awful that concept is because I think it's highlighted too when Brad asks a question at the end and he says to Ozzy, I think I've had one 15 second conversation with you ever. Yeah. And, you know, and I just think that that really shows a, a real problem with creating a jury in that fashion because they haven't actually played with everybody. Well, you know, two seasons to uh, where the jury system was very much like that are, are one of them is the one we love most. <laughs> because in edge of extinction everyone was on the jury yeah and, and with winners at war uh, yeah so although winners at war eh, they probably interacted but still yeah um so but yes I, I i was thinking the same thing when they did that this season i was like oh yeah it's like i forgot so. that 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 was one of the things i forgot that oh that's how they did that mm -hmm. and it to me just didn't feel right because you don't I don't know. Right. You don't have enough knowledge about that person other yeah. than what you're hearing from everybody else. Yep. So, all right. Well, we'll move on now to uh, to the rules. Uh, the season obviously began with tribes separated by race. But in the end, it came down to a different breakdown that Survivor would use in later season. Brains versus beauty or social game versus brawn. Mm. While that social game and brawn are certainly important, the focus of my articles and these podcasts uh, and these rules has always been on the brains. But it was so close. Just one vote separated Yule and Ozzy. What was the difference? How did Yule pull it off? And how much of his success should we attribute to the overpowered idol? Mm -hmm. Now that we've done a Cook Islands rewatch and I've gone back to my older articles and interviews from the original airing, it's time to take a new look at why you will won. Excellent. 
And we're going to do something that we occasionally do on our normal podcasts, but have not done in these special winner reviews yet, which is starting with a rule other than the first rule. Now, I know I just said, uh, focus on the brains. Rule number one, always the most important. But the seventh rule covers idols and advantages. And we're doing it because several parts of Yule's strategy dealt specifically with how he handled the idol. Yep. So it would be really odd to discuss his scheming of the first rule without talking about how he handled the idol first. Yes. Also, as I mentioned a minute ago, there is this question, this claim that Yule won primarily because of the overpowered idol. And we need to address that head on. Mm hmm. For sure. So. Yule said that he wanted to use the idol in a way that would turn the game around. And he did just that. In fact, at the time we gave him, not you and me, but we on the Reality News Online staff, uh, gave him a reality TV Hall of Fame moment for it. Uh, Yule could have uh, simply. Wow. Yeah. I, I bet he doesn't even have that printed out. Well, he probably does have that printed out on his wall. Of frame course. Somewhere. Of course you know, he does. Right next to one of our Next posters. to all of his other awards that he's yes. won throughout his life. What do you mean yeah. next to? In front of. You know? <laughs> so anyway, Yule could have simply held on to the idol, waited for the vote to go against him. But using it that way would have been of limited help. He would have been sent home. Uh, or he would have sent home Arrero. Rather, he wouldn't have been sent home, obviously. And if it had happened you know, right at the a particular time, the alliances would have ended up tied. He would have given up his main weapon and a tiebreaker could have decided the outcome of the rest of the game. Instead, Yule used his head, not just his mm -hmm. idol. He knew that Penner, of all people, played the game of Survivor rationally. He also knew that Penner wanted to stick around in the game and would not likely be swayed by friendships or other emotional attachments. And finally, he probably knew that Penner was the odd man out in his Raro alliance. This made Penner the perfect target for what was essentially blackmail. Yeah. Yule basically told him, switch sides or you're gone. Mm -hmm. I think this is very analogous to like the Chris Underwood situation. Where it's a strange twist that mm -hmm. is thrown into the game. And I feel like Yule took what is a horrible twist. Mm. I, I'm, I mean, horrible. I, I hate this on every level. Unless you're Yule, of course, then you yeah. love it. Uh, and but I feel like Yule used it in the best manner that he possibly could. He took full advantage of it and didn't just go, "Oh well, I've got this idol, and I'll just wait till they vote for me, and I'll play the idol and save myself." He used it so incredibly well. So that it was almost like, okay, he had this incredibly powerful idol, but he also added so many other components mm -hmm. to its use that it almost made it more enjoyable and appreciative of the way that he played it. Yeah. I would not go so far as to compare it to uh, Edge of Extinction. No, um, but it's like a similar, there's a similarity there where it's like they take something and they have this idea. They're like, oh, well, this will be interesting. How will this shake out? Mm -hmm. And I mean, honestly, like this type of idle power, you're guaranteed to stay in the game. 100%. Well, I mean, if people had listened to Cowboy and Plan Voodoo. Yes. <laughs> there were ways to get rid of him. It's oh, absolutely. Nobody ever did it. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's the thing. It's that this is unless people are willing to try to follow Plan Voodoo, mm -hmm. flush the idol, do something different instead of. Well, now we know that he has it, so we can't vote for him. It, you know, it's so he really took control of what nobody else in the game did. Nobody else took control of it the way that Yule did. Right, right. Now, there were some people who said Penner could have double crossed Yule. He could have told Yule he was good with the plan, but then convinced his Raro allies to vote against Becky instead. The main problem is that both Nate and Candace said in post show interviews that the reason the Raros voted against Yule was because Penner wanted to switch to Becky. Mm. Um, Penner himself told me the other Raros, quote, were not being rational. Uh, he suggested possibilities of what they could do if Yule had the idol, but they responded, Yule doesn't have the idol. Uh, he told me, I did everything in my power. And then what I told them the next night, or when I told them that, that Blech. When I told them the next night that Yule has the idol, they still didn't believe me. Yeah. 
That's you know, crazy. Right. And um, the thing is that th there was an additional aspect to it, which Ewell himself told me. I told Ewell said, I told him, you think they haven't voted you out because you work hard? Bullshit. They didn't vote you out because they think you have the idol. You're going to get screwed. And that was one reason that we saw Penner and uh, my quotes from Penner were what if situations, if yeah. Ewell has the idol, if, you know, I think Ewell has the idol was because he didn't want to come out and flat out admit that he didn't have the idol. Right. And I will say, I do appreciate the fact that this all like came to light during the game. And in a moment where I was like, okay, good. At least Penner is getting some like recognition for why he did what he did because mm -hmm. you will really put him in a very difficult position and kind of forced his hand to have to do that but it still didn't work they still hated penner so right oh like, yeah yeah you know and, and that was win. yeah and that was the thing i mean it wasn't simply that you will made a threat anyone can make a threat mm -hmm. he showed a particular understanding for who was the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and like you said he got to keep the idol. Sorry, you didn't say that. I'm jumping ahead in my mind. He got to keep the idol and he got credit for the move. And this is where we get to, like you said, Penner was the one who people were pissed at. I know. Even though Yule was the one who forced him to make the move. Right. And at the auction, Yule even said, I had the idol. I did this to flip Penner. And yeah. they still were pissed at Penner. I know. It's and, amazing. And he got credit for Oh, look at how well he played the game. Well, yeah, this is how he earned the title probably of Puppet Master, which is something else we'll hear probably a few more times in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the whole thing with the idol, like, I again, I like I appreciate the, the idea that like, oh, this mm -hmm. is something new. But I actually wanted to see something else about idol, you know, usage. What was this like season 13? Right. Is that yes. where we were at? Yeah. So. Idols weren't introduced until Guatemala, which was season 11. And so they're still a new concept, really, mm -hmm. right? Because there was only one idol in Guatemala. And, you know, there wasn't any crazy, like, uh, rules associated only with Only one like, idol? You mean not 14 idols that keep popping up everywhere? <laughs> I Come know, on, right? that's crazy talk. Crazy old school survivor, right? So I think that we're we're also looking at... A, a group of people who are still kind of learning the nuances of not only having to play survivor because it's a whole new mm -hmm. crew, but also this idea of idols. And because there had only been two seasons where you were actually able to see idols in play and idols were never played this way, you know, it wasn't, you know, you didn't get to save it until after the vote. And so I, I do think that it's it's great that he figured all of this out without having ever seen this construct before, you know, so great for you all mm -hmm. for figuring it out. And I also think that that's probably why there was such a hesitancy for the other people to acknowledge what was actually happening with the idol and that, well, it would make sense that you could have it because he went there, too. He went to the edge of extinction as well. It wasn't just Jonathan. And it, and unfortunately, I just don't think that there was enough like understanding of idols and the power that they actually have at that time, because we were only two seasons in with actual idols. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's true. And you mentioned you were going there. And yeah, he was lucky to be sent to Exile Island yes. when he was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every Survivor game is going to have some timing fluke that can work for or against a player. But luck is what you make of it on Survivor. Mm hmm. Um. It wasn't dumb luck that found the idol. He was smart enough to figure out its location with the two clues he was given. Mm -hmm. And and then on the recap episode uh, of the show, we saw that he ha hid or destroyed all the evidence that he had found it. Yes. But I will say that it's it's another one of those components of Survivor that I'm not a huge fan of is when there are limited chances for people to actually mm -hmm. have an opportunity to find something like that. Like they all know that there's an idol out there, but they're picking certain people to go. And so it's, it limits obviously who could have it, which of course you can figure into your gameplay, mm -hmm. but it also 
affects that luck component too, right? Because if right. they don't pick you, you never have a chance to get the idol. And uh, we saw very few people got picked to go to exile. And, and so it's one of those situations where I almost prefer when they're back at camp because then everyone's kind of got a fair shot because everyone right. is at the camp as opposed to who are we going to pick to go there? Yeah. I mean, the thing that I do like about who we pick is it's based on the game. Mm -hmm. Why did they pick Ewell? Because they thought he was a threat and they wanted to weaken him. Now, right. that was a stupid move on their part. For sure. Because they were viewing, and I think Taryn and company talked about this. Um, they were viewing it as a punishment. Ha, we're sending you to exile. No, I'd be like, you. send me, send me. Yes, yeah. I'll go. I want to okay. find an idol. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're not weakening him. You made him the strongest player in the game, which exactly. he probably already was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, he, it was like, yeah. okay, you're already Superman. Now, uh, on top of it, we're going to give you this laser gun. You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, it's like ridiculous. Um, Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, it. I, I mean, again, that's, so I, let me just say head on. Was the idol the reason he won? No, no, I don't think it was. I think he was smart enough to use the idol as another tool in his overall toolbox. Yes, but I do think that the mechanism that allowed him to stay as obviously to the end was the fact that no one could then vote for him. He figured that out. I mean, he right. came up with this. I'm going to let everybody know I have it. So then no one's going to vote for him. But that is way too powerful. You get to play it after the votes are read. You're sitting pretty at every tribal council. Yeah. If you have that in your pocket, you don't ever need to worry about it. Because as soon as your name comes up and you've got the most votes, here you go. And who's going to take that chance? Because the next person in line is going to get sent home if he plays the idol. So I, I don't like that there was that component to it because it really did make him almost invincible. But yes, he figured out the best way in which to have the idol by sharing it with everybody. So they were scared to vote for him. Yeah. And we'll talk about this later too, I'm sure. But the thing is, I don't think any of the I two four were ever voting against each other anyway, hmm. because they knew they had to stick together to make it to the end to be against other I2 because the whole jury was raro. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if they ever gave up majority, they were never winning. Yeah. So I don't think it was the idol that kept Yule in the game past a certain point. It was the loyalty of those four who could not do it. Now, would he have been able to flip Penner? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel like he would have anyway, because Penner in various places said, yeah, I'd rather actually play with the I-2-4. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, we'll never know. There's no right. way to ever know. Right. But, but yeah. All right. With our idle discussion behind us, we can expand on it to discuss the first and most important rule, which says to scheme and plot. And of course, what Ewell did with the idol was just one example of his abilities in this rule. And he had plenty more because he knew how important this aspect of the game was. At a tribal council fairly early in the game, Ewell said some people came for the experience, some to play a hard game. And uh, Jeff Probst replied, well, there's nothing wrong or right about either. This is where I was saying earlier, we're going to see where Jeff is wrong. Yet yeah, Jeff is wrong. Uh, there is definitely an incorrect way to play Survivor. And going for the experience, that falls squarely into that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Ewell obviously wasn't uh, one of those. He was there to win. And he started early, as this rule advises, making an alliance with Becky right mm -hmm. at the start. Uh, locking in a final five of the two of them, Penner, Candace, and Sundra. I mean, sure, Candace and Penner mutinied, but then Penner came back. Um, and so, you know, and then they added Ozzy out of necessity. And then, like I was just saying, they took that group all the way to the end. Yeah, and I do think that, I think there's a lot to be said about that particular group because I do think that if there is one kind of glaring 
trait that they each have, I do think there's a loyalty component. You yes. know, it's, it's, it is something that on Survivor is, is a hard thing to find. And when you find someone who you truly can believe is going to be loyal to you, that's like gold. And Becky saw that in Yule. Yule saw that in Becky. And then they were able to find those other people that they connected with. And I think that they just happened to bring four people together that really, truly believed in that and and didn't want to go against that component of the game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and not only did they have their I-24 alliance, but you all also maneuvered them so skillfully that they all felt like they were contributing equally to decisions. Yeah. But somehow every post-merge vote served Yule's game perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we go back to the Penner flip, we've already talked about Yule's use of the idol, but that wasn't his only strategic move in, in the way it happened. Because we saw... Ozzy wanted to keep Nate while Penner wanted Nate gone and Penner's preference won out, you know, so, or, or at least that's what it looked like, but we never saw the discussion where that decision was made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You all told me there was a lot more to it. He said it appeared like they actually gave Penner the discretion to vote out whoever he wanted, but it was really the two of them deciding to get rid of Nate together. Ozzy pushed hard to try to flip Nate to the point that you will realized they had to get rid of Nate. It was a mm -hmm. threat to that loyalty. Right. And Penner didn't want to flip if Ozzy was just going to flip the other way. So they decided that when they went to Ozzy, part of the bargain was going to be Penner will only flip if Nate is the one who goes. Mm -hmm. And so you all made it sound like there was no choice. Yeah. But that wasn't really it. But you will created that situation to make what he wanted happen. Yes. I think the wonderful thing about Yule is his ability to kind of look ahead so far mm -hmm. and kind of pre-plan out all of the scenarios. And, and how am I going to get to that point over there? He's not a knee-jerk reaction kind of person. He's very, I mean, you can always see him thinking and processing. And he does take the advice of the other people that he's speaking with. And what I always thought was fascinating is that he never really gave it an answer. If somebody provided a suggestion and said, well, this is what I'm, I would like to do, he would make that person have to explain to him the reason for it and but would do it in almost like a very it wasn't well why do you want to do that it was always like oh well that's that's interesting so let's kind of let's kind of go through that like what does that look like and how does mm -hmm. it and and so he was very good at kind of formulating his plan but making it appear as if they were all kind of melding their thoughts and, and plans together when in actuality, he really was saying, this is the best thing for me here. I just have to get everybody here, but I want to make it seem as if we're all getting there together. He, it, it was masterful to watch him do that. Yeah. And I mean, this where, you know, gets back to that term puppet master I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, you know, Parvati used the term for you all in episode 12's tribal council in the final six tribal council she said you had been playing seamlessly and had also been playing the jury and by the way side note uh she still didn't vote for him no she which didn't. is a point that sticks in my craw for someone who supposedly valued strategy mm -hmm. but fine that's beside the point we'll let that go um anyway getting back to the point adam said in the final five tribal council that you was in control of the game and had been for a while you told me he didn't think he really was the puppet master uh he said i don't think that's the way i worked i think i was an effective leader but i built consensus and listened to what people had to say it assured excuse me it assured our alliance was really tight because they weren't under the control of some dictatorial leader i don't think anyone ever felt the incentive to defect from our alliance and that goes to what you were saying mm -hmm. you know how he listened and built the consensus and everything else because the thing is as much as he denied it he was pulling the strings oh for sure absolutely mm -hmm. you know, even when they were apparently made by consensus he took advantage of them we know that a good leader can guide consensus in the direction he wants absolutely just like we talked about for how he voted out nate 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he he did it in such a way that even the people he was doing it with never caught on to what he was doing until it yeah. was basically too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, go back to the uh, to the Penner vote. Yule told me this was a group decision made by the I-24, but Yule used this in two different ways. First, he had his own private reasons for wanting Penner out because Yule believed that Penner was the only one who stood a chance of mounting a successful attack against Yule. Mm -hmm. Second, of course, Adam told Yule that he would vote for him at the end if he voted out Penner first. Right. And, you know, Yule didn't go back and tell Adam, well, it was a group decision. You know, he took advantage of it. He earned Adam's vote, which was obviously a key to winning. Mm -hmm. And he told me it seemed like the tide was going against Jonathan and the others perceived me as the puppet master. So I might as well use it to my advantage. Right. And I do think that it's interesting that that whole scenario about the was that a a consensus and was that a group decision Mm -hmm. in regards to Adam promising his vote? You can't save it at the end. You know, they're all trying to explain, oh, no, 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 that was a that was a group decision and that was a consensus. I mean, I think at that point, there's so many things that are kind of like up in the air that I I, I don't think that Adam was wrong for saying, well, I'm going to stick true to the promise that mm-hmm. I made because what I'm being told right now doesn't fit the narrative of right. what I was seeing happen and what I know was happening in the game. So maybe it was a group decision, but clearly it worked in Yule's favor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, the interesting thing to me is that Ewell came into Survivor thinking he could play with complete honesty and integrity. Uh, We've heard those words before. (laughs) Uh, He's obviously not the first to believe it. And usually we end up making fun of somebody who says that. Um, You know, might have had a podcast where there was a lot of discussion of those two words and and a certain man named Coach. But uh, the difference here is... But I still love Coach. Oh, yeah. 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 you know, the difference is that Ewell quickly realized it couldn't be done. Yeah. Uh, you know, coach three seasons still didn't realize it. But, you know, others were voted out and, and went on other seasons like that, clinging to that idea. Mm-hmm. Ewell told me, I quickly realized I was being naive. Again, some players never realize that. Yeah. Uh, he added, my goal was to play the game and do it with as much integrity as the game allowed. There was no case where I misled someone where I didn't think it was absolutely necessary to do so. I was very careful in parsing my words so I didn't have to lie. At least for me, it helped. But at some point, I realized I was just splitting hairs. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he was being a lawyer. You know, he was, you know, you're a lawyer. I work with lawyers all the time. Mm hmm. This is sometimes the way a lawyer will think and talk. It's like, oh, well, I wasn't lying. I was just reading it to the letter (laughs) under the moonlight of, you know, it's like, yeah, but that doesn't work on Survivor. And he realized that. And some players never realize that. Some players will say, well, I never lied. I just omitted the truth. No, everybody's going to think that's a lie. Yeah, that reminds me of my relationship with my husband sometimes. (laughs) Uh oh. <laughs> well, because I'll answer questions and he'll say, "Stop being a lawyer, please." And I'm like, because I I have a tendency to try to explain things, and and yes, there is there is a mechanism by which we present information to yes. put forth our case, and it doesn't always work sometimes when your spouse is looking for a straight up response. Yeah. Did you wash the dishes? <laughs> well, what exactly do you mean by wash? How? <laughs> How do we define wash? Now, exactly? I'm always the one washing the dishes. Oh, okay. So well, that's not that's not an issue. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah. Even even once you'll realize that he would need to deceive and manipulate, he still managed to do it all without making it seem like he was the villain. Yeah. There's I, it, and I really do feel like that is an art form that if someone can be so smooth and not feel like the person on the receiving end is like getting played. You know, it, it's it's a very incredible thing to see and to know that he was able to win over the I2 members and really convince them of what was transpiring was the best for all of them because as viewers, we're watching this going, my God, they're on a sinking ship. You know, mm-hmm. as far as we're concerned, you've aligned yourself with, I, I, I believe the Ozzy and um, Yule were referred to as giants, you know, that you're sitting between two giants. Right. And so it's incredible that he was able to convince them so 
flawlessly that this was in everyone's best interest when it was completely not in Sundra's best interest or in Becky's best interest. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, yeah. Moving on to Becky, like, like you did, um, you know, even though she didn't get any votes, she was still the second best schemer of the three. For sure. You know, when I interviewed Adam, I asked what he thought about Yule taking credit for a group decision to vote out Penner. Adam said he still thought Yule ran the show, but after watching, he acknowledged that Becky had a little more input. Mm -hmm. uh, Yule said on the early show that Becky was an equal partner as far as strategizing, and he didn't think he would have gotten as far in the game without her. Uh, he didn't think she got as much credit as she deserved. Becky herself talked to me about how before the mutiny, she and Candace would strategize and then go back to Yule and Jonathan, respectively, uh, e even though that wasn't shown. So they she was scheming. Mm -hmm. uh, right. She told me I was behind the scenes making the necessary alliances to stay in the game. Yeah. And I think what happens in Survivor and what we see a lot with duos is there's always that one that is a little more out there a little more visual and there's always that other one that's a little more behind the scenes mm -hmm. and when the season comes out all of a sudden people who are on the season with them start noticing things that they never saw before because that person was playing a different type of game and you know i think that we talked a lot about natalie white in this regard when she was doing a lot of things with Russell Hance, but mm -hmm. Russell Hance was the muscle. He was, he was the guy that everybody saw and they didn't necessarily focus on Natalie white. And you really had to look closely to see what she was doing. But then you realize, my gosh, she is doing a lot of things that are just not as flashy and visual. And I feel like Becky is kind of in that same boat where she's aligned with the muscle and he is the, he's the muscle. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, Wow. Um, but so but it's one of those things where you have to be cognizant of that when you are kind of choosing who that second is going to be, because if they outshine you and you're sitting in the final three or final two together, it's going to be how is your game different than that person's game? If everything you did was a consensus and if everything you did was together, someone's got to get credit for it in the end because right. two people can't win. Right. Yeah. I mean, these days, of course, there's a special corollary in the first rule that says you have to make sure your scheming and plotting is at least somewhat noticeable. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back, the first time that we uh, really started talking about it and that I added it was Aubrey and Co Wrong. Mm. But we've seen and, and we've seen it a number of times in seasons since then. But as it turns out, yeah, you mentioned Natalie. Uh, now, Natalie wasn't a problem because she won. Right. So, um, but we have it at least here in the form of Becky. Mm -hmm. She was behind the scenes, apparently too much. And the jury didn't know about it. Right. Yule was the public face. And, you know, Becky was stuck in the background, even though she also followed this rule. And Yule didn't piss off the people on the jury. Right. Like Russell Hans did. Yes. So that's, or at least not all of them, but yes. Right. But so that's, so the, the, it is an interesting kind of comparison to make that, if you are the one leading the charge, but you also have a winning personality and mm -hmm. and people appreciate what you're doing, if you are at the forefront and you know the other person is not, then that person in the forefront, like Yule, is going to get the credit. Yeah, yeah. So now we can move on to Ozzy, who did not follow the first rule nearly as well as the other two. You know, I was uh, looking forward to what you were going to say about Oscar yes, because yes, Oscar, I know that yes, you right. have some feelings about Oscar. So this will yes. be interesting. Yes. Well, I'll let him tell the tale by quoting his interview with me. I love he it. said, I probably screwed up a bit in my strategy and that I didn't do enough politicking and did too much fishing. Mm. Now, People may be saying, I've heard that before, because this is a quote that I right. use frequently. <clears throat> um, you know, I say, Ozzy can never win. And this is why. After each game and each time that I interviewed him, he recognizes what the problem was. But then whenever he got back out there, he went right back to form. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so he told me. My strategy was basically to be the top provider and to let that sink in at an early stage of the game where if there was any thought of voting me off, people would feel the pings in the, in the stomachs and realize where their sustenance was coming from. Once you make it to the merge, it becomes individual. So you have to win the challenges. 
Mm -hmm. I've said it before. Winning challenges is not a strategy. In this case, Ozzy made it to the end, whereas in previously discussed situations, that didn't always happen. But even so, he made it to the end by basically only playing the challenge portion of the game. Yeah, and this guy is like a machine I, to oh. watch. I mean, my God, it, it was incredible to just see how he could perform in these challenges and his ability to go fishing the way that he was. I mean, all of these things are incredibly impressive. And as far as, you know, actually playing the game, great for the other people who are on his tribe, who mm -hmm. he's helping win and also feed. So it's all good for them as well. But it is not something that you can hang your hat on anymore in Survivor because we're way past it actually being about survival. Uh, and and I do think that there are so many other ways in which people can acquire food. They can win food. There's rewards. There's all of these other things. There's coconut gods that seem to just drop coconuts when you're out there. So, you know, I really do think that there are other ways in which people would survive. But this is like a great added bonus. You're like, oh, he's coming back with 12 fish. This is wonderful. But yeah, I'm in, surprised in, people didn't gain weight on this season. I know. There were so many fish. It was incredible. And I will say, delicious. Probably some of the best fish you'll ever eat when it's just like fresh and right mm -hmm. there and you're eating it. And so, yeah, certainly, certainly helpful to everyone, but not enough to carry you through in a game like this with the way that it's now played. Yeah, I mean, you said it. You know, There's a reason that part of the rules... As they were written at the time, it's not there anymore, but part of the rules that they were written at the time said hunting and fishing are, well, actually this part is, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself again. Hunting and fishing are likely not very big issues. Instead, the real survivor survival skills necessary here are more along the lines of something you might learn from Renaissance schemer Niccolo Machiavelli than anything you can get from a survival book. And Ozzy was definitely in the survival book camp. So this is what I was alluding to. Even back then, I did have a rule saying providing food wins allies. Yes. But that was the seventh rule. Mm -hmm. Scheme and plot was and still is the first rule. Yes. Food is good, but the only certain way to stick around is to create a trusted alliance. And and don't get me wrong, too, because you are right. Food does create allies. And mm -hmm. that is it is a very strong thing to bring to the table when you can when you can say to your tribe, look what I just came back with, whether it be 12 fish, whether it be 12 coconuts that you found, you know, whatever the case may be, if you're the person that can make fire, these are all things that are necessary components while you're out there. And so if you have that as one of your extras, then when people are trying to figure out who should we vote out, they might not keep you on the list because they might be like, well, that fish is really delicious. So mm -hmm. we can get to Ozzy later. Uh, but it's but it's not going to carry you. I mean, you take that survival component and his ability to fish and his ability to climb trees and his ability to live in the jungle and thrive and add that to a strategic game like we saw with Yule. Whoa. You know, I mean, well, you've right. got it would be amazing, but he's never been able to balance the two out because he's a likable knife, a guy, you know, and he's out there like he's, but it's just, that's not who Ozzy is. He is yeah. not the strategist. He is the survival guy. Yeah. I mean, Adam pointed out at the final five tribal council that Ozzy won challenges while Yule was behind it all. And then Adam told me that even though he found new respect for Becky's game, as I mentioned a little while ago, he still didn't think Ozzy really had any input into the Alliance's decisions. Yeah. He was very kind of just kind of laid back, letting things kind of happen. Mm -hmm. And as long as like, listen, if it works for me, great. And I'm still going to go fish and we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then Sundra also told me Becky, Yule and myself discussed everything. Now, note who's missing from that list. Mm -hmm. She continued in the same vein by adding Yule always came to Becky and me and we all spoke about it together again. Right. Her, Becky, Yule. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. an I2-4. One mm -hmm. person is missing from that list. Yes. Awesome. So then, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Oscar. Uh, so then how did Ozzy make it so far? Well, it's because he found himself in an alliance through very little political effort of his own. Before the mutiny, he was considered an outsider. Uh, the mutiny solidified his position and brought those four more tightly together. Um, 
Ozzy's role was to win challenges. He was not the strategist of the group. And I mean, remember back to the early in the season when he did try to have some allies, he went with people like Cowboy and Flicka. Yeah. Not exactly a strategic think tank there. Yeah. Well, and I think that in Ozzy's world, when he's out in, you know, the on the islands, he's very comfortable in that space. And so for him, it's it's a fun atmosphere and he wants to be around people who are fun. And that's probably mm -hmm. why he chose Cowboy and Flicka, because he's not looking at this the same way Yule is looking at it, where like this is a game where I have to work with people who are going to think like me and have an end game. We want to win a million dollars like this is what we're going for. Whereas I and I Ozzy might have even referenced it at the beginning of the season. He wanted to have fun in mm -hmm. addition to, you know, being out there playing this game. And so, yeah, I do think his choices early on really showed the issues that he had with making those choices. And then also, I'm, I'm curious if there was no mutiny or if, you know, it, one, if it wasn't offered or mm -hmm. two, if it didn't happen, if they just decided, you know, if Jonathan and Candace didn't mutiny, how significant a role would Ozzy have played moving forward? Because Penner was catching fish like there was no tomorrow as well. Right. So... How important is Ozzy at that point? If he's on the outs already and they're concerned that he might become a challenge beast and, you know, once they get to the merge and start winning all of these immunities, maybe Ozzy isn't as significant and maybe he goes home as opposed to making it to the end being right. that four. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, like anything else in Survivor, one thing changes and how does everything. Oh, for sure. Everything yeah. happen. You know, you don't draw the uh, the, the wrong rock and uh, we might not be sitting here talking right now. I know I might be in a bigger house. Yeah, and my exactly. Loans paid off. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thought about that a lot. Thanks yeah. for reminding uh, me. Sorry. Wait, come on. <laughs> sitting here talking to me is way better than that, obviously. Oh, my God. Yes. I love having a mortgage and I yeah. love having school loans. And I, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's so much fun. So fun. All right. So uh, let's sell uh, some more posters. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so moving on quickly here, uh, we can go to the second <laughs> rule, which says uh, not to scheme and plot too much and to keep your scheming secret. Clearly, since Yule was called the puppet master and the godfather and who knows what else, uh, he wasn't able to follow this rule completely. But while his alliance was certainly out in the open, he at least kept his side scheming secret to the point that even Ozzy only found out about some of it at the reunion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and because Yule didn't want to come off like a Penner type villain, he just he we talked about earlier, he kept his scheming to the minimum necessary to to achieve his goals. I do think though, that he, in this particular rule, he couldn't do what we suggest people do, you know, right. keeping it, it secret. He had to put it out there as far as the idol is concerned to really right. play the idol to its full advantage. So mm -hmm. in this particular space, he violated the rule by being like, Hey, guess what guys? Like here it is. And I'm putting this out there. And it was very clear what he was doing, but it worked for him. Cause, yeah, you know, it right. really did, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Ozzy and Becky didn't scheme and plot enough or as visibly in Becky's case. Uh, so we know they didn't violate this rule. Um, and, and that was probably the main reason Ozzy got as many votes as he did. At the final six tribal council, Ewell commented that the jury might favor Ozzy because he'd been playing more of, quote, a clean game. Mm, yeah. Well, and I think, too, you had a you had a kind of I hate to say a young jury, but I do think that you had people that were less inclined to really get behind the strategy and maybe get more behind that. Well, this was fun and I had a mm -hmm. good time with this guy versus I didn't have a good time with that guy. So I could see why that would would definitely be a concern as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, before we move on, I, I do want to talk about another instance of scheming and plotting too much that didn't involve our finalists, but it did help to lead them there. And you just brought this up and that's the mutiny mm -hmm. at the reunion. Probst asked Candace about it and then said, that's the way you have to play. You have to make big moves to have a shot. No, Jeff, you don't No, You were sitting in front of a guy who made a whole bunch of smaller moves in order to win. 
Mm -hmm. and you're still shouting about you have to make big moves. Yeah. And Candace wasn't in a bad spot. Right. She did that. And I I, listen, Candace is she's wonderful. And I know she's come back and she's played other Mm -hmm. seasons. I mean, like serious respect for her, but she missed Adam and she missed poverty and she wanted to be with those people. And she didn't want to wait until the merge too. It was more fun. That was one of the things she said too. Their camp is more fun than our camp. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that's, that is not enough reason at all because she was in a great spot. She was in an an alliance with Penner, with Yule herself and with Becky. Why are you running away from that? And I think even Sundra at that point was Mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? Like, why are you stepping off the mat and walking away from that? Yeah. I like present day Candace a lot. Yes. Okay. I did not. I was surprised at how much I did not like Cook Islands Candace. It was just because was she crazy. was yeah, she was such a kid. Yes. You know, I mean, and she was just immature. Yeah. And I didn't remember that. I still thought of her as present day Candace. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's just interesting looking back in time, 15 years and seeing, oh, wow, yeah, she's yeah. way different. Well, and that's why I say it was, you know, a young jury, you know, right. where you have people who are looking at the world through a different lens because mm-hmm. they haven't been exposed to as much as someone like a Yule who might have, you know, gone through more things at that point. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so I do think that that's a very real concern when you're playing this game with what are people focusing on when they're sitting on that jury? You know, are they focusing on who did I have the most fun with or who was actually playing this game to win? Yeah. Yeah. All right. The third rule talks about being flexible. Uh, how do you think you all did here? Well, it's interesting because he didn't need to be, if that makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he really had people locked and loaded. Like he was like, I've got my group. And I, I know what's going to happen. I know the conversations I have to have with them. I know what I've got to do. So he, he was almost in a position where he didn't need to be flexible and he didn't, so he didn't have to be because he was so on point with everything that was happening. And even when he was thrown things like the mutiny, he made it work because he already had so many things solidified with at least two of those people. So I guess Ozzy would have been his flexibility where he made it work with Ozzy. But, you know, I mean, overall, he had everything lined up from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, and this has happened. I, I, I hadn't noticed this until we started doing these podcasts, this series of podcasts. But w- where we've gotten to this rule and said, well, yeah, the winner did just stick with one alliance. But then we go on to say, well, they didn't just hope it survived, which is, uh, you know, against this rule. Um, they made it happen. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's exactly what happened here again. You know, Yule's only chance. And as I discussed earlier, any of the I2's only chance was if the I24 became the final four. Right. Mm-hmm. And so they needed to stay solid, which they did. And then even within that structure, I will say Yule was flexible when he needed to be or when he could be. Uh, that allowed him to bring Penner back in even after Penner had backstabbed Yule once. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we discussed how he subtly manipulated his allies, uh, but he also talked after the game about how sometimes he let other decisions occur if they weren't important to his overall game plan. Yes. And so, you know, there, he he understood no reason to push an opinion and use up that social capital if you didn't need to. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Ozzy was in a similar situation, except that while Yule was leading the alliance they both stuck with, Ozzy was tagging along, as we've discussed. Mm-hmm. But he still was correct not to flip and to go, you know, with the Raros, because if he'd made final three against one of them... I, I already discussed it. The the Raro jury, jury would have given it to one of their own. That's just the way they were playing. Uh, so he really was in the best possible position. His main problem, besides not following the first rule, was that it was a final three instead of a final two. So he didn't even have a chance to potentially get rid of Yule and just face Becky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, would he have gotten rid of Yule? I don't know. Um, but... I think he would have. I Well, it would have been smart to, obviously. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, could Becky have beaten him? Maybe. You know, I mean, maybe Becky could have claimed 
No, I was the power behind the throne. And I think the only saving grace you would have had is mm-hmm. you will be on the jury. And that's what I was just going to say. You <laughs> just pulled those words right out of my mouth. See um, right there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, and the thing is, yes, with Becky, it's great that she had such a tight alliance and friendship with Ewell, but she never considered turning on him. Right. So, you know, that's what you want in an ally, obviously. But if she wanted to win herself, she had to realize she couldn't do it against you. Yeah. She had to break the bond. It wouldn't have been easy, both from an emotional standpoint and in actually doing it since he had the idol. Mm-hmm. But that was her only chance to win. Abandon Ewell somewhere along the line. Step up. Claim his role as the brain. Well, and not that I want to, you know, shift gears too far here, but... That was something that was very similar in my season when Ken turned on David. And that Mm -hmm. was what I was hoping was going to be what Ken put forth in front of the jury was that that was my plan all along. You know, that I was going to work with this guy. We were going to strategize together. We were going to make it to the end. And then I was going to cut him exactly when I needed to. That would have been beautiful. And if if Becky had done that, if she had presented it in that way, that like this was my plan from the beginning, I knew that he was going to be a great ally and everything was working really well. But I also knew that I was going to have to get rid of him. And if she had, she certainly could have argued that before the jury. And I think it would have gained her a lot of props because it would have shown her awareness of not only the game, but also how people were perceiving Yule, Mm -hmm. which would have reflected very well on her. Yeah. Yeah, but she unfortunately she didn't, didn't do, do it. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, it, it, why didn't she do it? Well, let's move to the fourth rule, which tells players not to let their emotions control them. And you know, we were just talking about how she not only had a strong alliance but also a friendship. She said turning on Yule would have been like turning on family, and she also said that Yule's friendship was worth more than money. See, much like I was saying with you and me, this is worth more than you having won the million dollars. Really? Okay. I'll keep telling myself that. I will. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, that's all fine and good. But as much as we might admire Becky's sentiments in real life, we can't ignore that she completely broke this rule when it came to the game of Survivor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is a very hard concept for people to really wrap their brain around sometimes is that. This is a game for a million dollars. And unfortunately, you are going to have to hurt people's feelings and you are going to have to hurt who you deem Mm -hmm. to be friends feelings at some point. And I mean, because it that's it's a game and and that's the the whole structure of it is to really get into people's heads and make them uncomfortable and have to make decisions about things that in real world life you wouldn't do. But here there's a million dollars on the line and the only shot that she would have had to step up and try to show that she was in charge and not Yule was if she had made that determination to take him out of the game and she could not separate the two. And I'm sure Yule can sit back and say the same thing like, Oh, well our friendship is more important than money, but guess who has a million dollar check? Right. That right. guy. Yeah. And the thing is he never had to make that decision really. No. And he had no problem in this rule because Yeah, there were some people he liked more than other people, but Mm -hmm. he never let it affect what he believed to be the best strategic move. Right. You know, in many ways, he is the definition of the term game bot when it comes to this rule. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah. Um, Now, Ozzy, not a game bot, but also did not have any problems here. Uh, he, He played with his heart, but he didn't let his heart interfere. You know, and a perfect example is, again, to go back to the situation with Nate that we discussed. The two of them were becoming friendly. Ozzy wanted Nate to stay. But when Ozzy found out that, supposedly, the only way to get Jonathan to flip was by voting out Nate, well, he went along with it. That was the game. Yeah. And I do think that Ozzy's ability to kind of go with the flow helped him in this role too, where mm-hmm. he, he didn't necessarily seem to attach to any one person or any one thing. There were some ideas that he seemed more attached to than anything. But as far as like the people that he was playing the game with, it was more about Ozzy than anything. And so right. that's why I, you know, I don't think that he ever struggled with this too much because it really was Ozzy wants to win challenges. Ozzy wants to win challenges. Ozzy wants to win challenges and maybe win a million dollars. You forgot that Ozzy wants to win challenges. Oh, that too. And catch fish. Yes, yes, yes. That's true. 
All right. Well, the fifth rule talks about the social game and reminds players that they need to pretend to be nice. Uh, once again, I don't think you all had any problems here. While some of those who voted for Ozzy were what we might think of as bitter in terms of jurors, I, I they weren't upset because they disliked you all. They were upset because he outplayed them. And like you said, they were young. Yeah. Um, you know, Yule was, is, probably always will be an incredibly likable guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now, it might seem obvious that Ozzy also fit into that mold. But when I interviewed him, he mentioned one instance of messing up this rule that he thinks might have cost him the win. It was something we didn't really see. He was talking about when Jonathan had caught a bunch of fish, and this was the day after Adam and others had called uh, uh, Penner names, and uh, and Penner decided he didn't want to share. Ozzy said, that really upset the others, and I didn't play my cards as well as I could have. I was blamed a bit for that as well as Jonathan. Tempers flared, and I lost my cool, and I talked back to Candace. And that was another thing that may have made her decide not to vote for me. Now, all these years later, I don't know if that was the reason or not. I'd like to think Candace voted for Yule because he was this strategic mastermind. But yeah, fighting over something like this did not help Ozzy's case at all. No, and I, again, have to go back to what we've already talked about with some of the the maturity levels that we mm -hmm. were seeing with some of the issues that arose on this particular season where you do have such a, a disparity in just people's worldviews and, and how young some people just really came across. And mm -hmm. the, and to me, watching that whole scene, obviously I've, you know, I'm an older individual and I'm, I'm watching this from my couch. I'm not living it, but you're it's a one younger of, individual. <laughs> I wish, but it's one of those situations where, yeah, I mean, these people are not helping. They're not, providing for anything in the camp and there's clearly a divide and the fact that Candace was so appalled that they wouldn't share well I mean do you blame them can you really be that upset I understand in the moment it was probably yeah. terrible and it was probably she was hungry and wanted to eat but then pick up the spear and go get some fish yeah you know yeah, you're, I mean, a, you're a jerk and a slime bag and a backstabber yeah. and and a, a piece of garbage and hey how come you didn't share your food with me yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting, um, thing to see. And then there was an instance where we saw Adam eating coconut and Penner went to take a piece and then he was quickly like slapped away. Like Adam was eating that, like that was yeah. Adam's and Penner was like, Oh, well, I just, I just was taking a piece of coconut mm -hmm. and suddenly there was like no sharing of food there. So it, I do feel like they're, this was a group of people that were feeling a little more negatively affected by things that were happening around camp and then letting that affect their psyche and how they viewed things and what they thought about people. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Candace remembered that and thought about it because Yule was part of that, too. But Yule wasn't saying anything. Right. And, yeah. you know, and it was Ozzy's idea, too. Yeah, that's I think the he's the one thing. that brought it up first. Well, at least what we saw on TV right, that's was true. that, yeah, that it was Ozzy's idea. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I interviewed him, he made it sound like it was Penner's idea and he went along with it. But what we saw on TV was that it was Ozzy's idea. Like, why right. are we sharing with them? You know, Right. So, yeah. I don't know. So it's crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, the sixth rule warns against being too much of a threat. We'll start with Ozzy for this one. Now, Jessica, what do you think? Was um, Ozzy a threat at all in this game? Hmm, I'm going to go with, yeah, uh, to win a whole bunch of challenges. Like, hmm, he, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's the thing, too. I mean, and not that I'm speaking ill of anyone winning those challenges. Those, no. Those are hard yeah. challenges. I mean, serious props for winning the way that he did. I mean, the guy is a phenomenal athlete. But it, again, is one of those things that we've seen in Survivor time and time again, where the person who needs to win mm -hmm. wins challenges to keep them in the game. And and I, I, I'm curious if Ozzy, I mean, I know he was with the I-24, but if that was kind of the same mindset where like I need to win in order to stay in the game. And so it is this weird mix with Ozzy because. He's winning the challenges, which gets him immunity, so he can't be voted out. So that becomes very threatening to people who are like, oh, well, 
what if he wins the final challenge? You know, who's he going to mm -hmm. take to the end with him? So these are all conversations you have to have when someone is winning so many challenges. But then at the same time, he's not as threatening in the way in which he's playing the game. Right. And so you've at least got that where you can say, well, even if I'm sitting next to him, if you're Yule, I can say, well, I outplayed him. He might have won challenges, but I outwit him. I outplayed him on the mental strategic part mm -hmm. of this game that we all need to play. And so the challenges were great, but I think it was a really awesome kind of play on words, if you will, or argument that you all made about how I was letting Ozzy win challenges. I thought that was very clever because he downplayed the significance of the challenge wins by doing that. And I thought oh, that yeah. was really interesting that you will kind of threw that out there like, oh, I was letting him win. It made him happy. He wanted to win. So I let him win. I thought that was really, really clever. Well, yeah. And you will actually told me that one of his biggest fears was to be seen as too much of a threat. And, you know, that's one reason he kept downplaying the idea that he was the puppet master, even though he was. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, on on the strategic side, he deflected attention to Jonathan. And on the challenge side, he obviously deflected to Ozzy. He said that he didn't exactly throw challenges, but he made sure he didn't win if Ozzy was going to. Right. So he he told me. When we were down to the I-24, once we got to the numbers, it didn't make sense for me to win. I had hidden immunity and nobody felt threatened, so I didn't need it. If I actually won it, it would have put me in the awkward position where I felt pressure to give it, the, the hidden immunity, to somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. But who, who would I give it to? For me, my goal was to come in second place. Close enough that if Ozzy faltered, I could win and keep the Raros from claiming it. But as long as he was winning it, that wasn't necessary. I don't want to take anything from Ozzy. I went all out for the first two thirds of a challenge. And once it became clear Ozzy would win, I'd kind of take my foot off the gas a bit. I'm not saying I could have beaten him. The guy's just incredible, but it worked out very well. I love that so much. That yeah. is a guy who is thinking through every scenario when it comes to this game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he even continued. For me, having Ozzy around was great. He was the single best insurance against having against any of the rares making it to the finals, and he deflected so much attention away from me. As long as Ozzy was there, any discussion about splitting the four was always talking about voting out Ozzy, never me. It really did serve my own strategic interests. Love you all. <laughs> What'd you say? You love me? <laughs> I love <laughs> <laughs> love you, love you. If I were Billy, I'd be like, oh, it's. it's oh, my uh, God. That's yeah. that's it. It's See? more than a million. See, again. Yes, more than a million worth dollars. More than See? a million dollars. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be careful the way you say things. You know? I know. And drinking wine doesn't help. Oh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, we already talked about uh, rule number seven. So we'll move to Appendix A, which is about the rest of the top tribe keeping their end goals in mind when voting. And says to vote out the weak, then the strong, then the weak, then the strong. Um, well, we already talked about how you will always kept his end goals in mind. Mm -hmm. And from the early days, he he was thinking about it. You know, he and Penner worked early on to save Becky when Cowboy was trying to vote her out. Yeah. And, you know, from then on, he always was thinking ahead, thinking scenarios, no matter what he was doing. Now, I have to admit, I didn't go back and analyze whether he specifically voted out weak versus strong players once the I-24 alliance took hold of the game because it really didn't matter. He focused mm -hmm. on getting out the appropriate person at the appropriate time. Yeah, he he was like a machine. He really was. Yeah. He was. He was very aware of everything that was happening around him all the time and was very aware of the ramifications of what would happen if this happens, then that, if that happens, then mm -hmm. this, I mean, he would work through all the computations and it really was an impressive game to watch because he was so aware of what was going on and he never walked into a tribal council, not knowing what was going to happen. And right. I, you know, I think that this is someone who was very mindful of the end game from day one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the end game, Appendix B covers the jury phase and final tribal council. Now, I'm not sure if any minds were really made up at the final tribal council. 
Uh, Yule talked about Yule things. Ozzy talked about Ozzy things. Um, you know, I mean, for example, you will open by saying he had to manipulate and deceive, but he was loyal to those who were loyal to him. Okay. We'd heard that before. Ozzy said he was the underdog who provided and embraced every aspect of the game wholeheartedly. Um, we've heard that before now, lucky for him. I wasn't there cause I had to jumped up and said, well, you did miss the key aspect of the game. Um, but later, Yule did basically say that. He said in response to the question from Jenny that strategy is the most important part, not physical ability. Yeah, he Yule did very well at, again, downplaying everything that Ozzy did and making yeah. it insignificant as far as the game of Survivor is concerned. Well, at the same time, building up Becky, I thought it was interesting because he wasn't downplaying what Becky did. And I mm -hmm. think probably because Becky was doing what he was doing. So, you know, he wanted to make it all seem across the board. Like, yes, this was, this is what we were doing together. But then those extra things that Ozzy had going on, don't pay any attention to that. Like that's right. just a shiny key distraction. Like don't look over there, just look over here. So he's, again, it's his ability to communicate and put forth those ideas of what he wants people to really focus on. It's like you're telling someone how to feel about something without telling them how to feel about it. Right. You're just, you're kind of floating this idea and then they're figuring out their own like, oh, maybe that really wasn't that important. Maybe mm -hmm. that really didn't matter that much, but you're not saying that, but you're helping them get there. Right. Right. You know, and he also had some interesting questions that he had to answer. Uh, the, the, the most, uh, famous one perhaps was Candace saying mm. yes or no. Yes. Uh, have you been shamelessly working the jury? And he was like, Hmm, Hmm, <laughs> Hmm. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, the thing is, yeah, shamelessly working the jury is part of this appendix. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I mean, I could tell when watching that he said certain things at earlier tribal councils that were absolutely aimed at getting the jury on his side, much mm -hmm. like you were just saying. He didn't wait for the final tribal council. He no. subtly, or sometimes not so subtly, uh, planted seeds as time went by. And then he helped those seeds to grow in the final questioning. Yeah. And the hat thing, we got to spend a little bit of time on the hat thing, mm -hmm. because I do think that it's interesting that Jeff Probst allowed that to happen because Jeff could have put a kibosh on that in two seconds. He could have yeah. went over, got the hat and that never happened. And then it wouldn't have been in the actual edit. You never would have seen it. And Jonathan would have had his hat back. He would have gotten it back after tribal council done and done because there is supposed to be no. Right. interaction between the two and jeff not only allowed it to happen he then pointed it out to the room like do you see what he's doing everyone do you see how he's playing you mm -hmm. and how he's he's garnering a vote over here and people are still like hmm I don't know. Maybe. I mean, he wanted his hat back, you know, yeah. and it, and Yule was like, well, he asked for his hat back. So I brought him his hat back. But it was interesting that like he made it seem so just like, ah, just don't worry about that. I was doing Penner a favor. He asked yeah. for it back and I brought it back. But Jeff was trying so hard to like pound it into these people's skulls. Like, do you see what's happening? And they were still just like, mm, no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, none of the jury saw him bring it. Right. So if Jeff, Jeff had pointed it out. Right. But on the other hand, you know that the person who was voted out that night would have gone back to the jury and said, oh, yeah, you will brought that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, you might as well. It's not like it's any new inf or information they wouldn't have gotten. Right. Anyway. But it's one of those things that Jeff could have put a kibosh on. I mean, they right. still would have found out that he brought it. But I feel like Jeff highlighted it so much. Like there's yeah. a reason why he brought that back. He wasn't just being nice. He wasn't mm -hmm. just giving back his hat. He was actually doing it because he wants him to vote for him. And, uh, you know, and, and people still were. I mean, unaware. you know, I said earlier, uh, way at the top of the podcast, uh, I said, you know, Jeff made a number of comments that were often directed against Yule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because for a long time, who's the type of player that Jeff has always liked? The Oscar. challenge winners. <laughs> Oscar. Yeah. Yeah. Oscar. <laughs> you know, there's a reason that Oscar was brought back multiple times. You yeah. know, there's mm -hmm. so um, but but anyway. I love um, you, Jeff. Don't worry, I love you, Jeff. Yes. Really. Yes. <laughs> and you'll go and win a bunch of challenges and and uh get fish if you're back on again, right? Absolutely. Yes, yes. I was so. very good at getting snails. 
and oh. coconuts. I was well, very good I mean, at getting coconuts. The, the snails don't move very quickly, to be fair. No, but you got to find them. And that's okay. the that's the tricky okay. part. Yes. Um, now, an important part of uh, this appendix is setting yourself up for success at the end. And besides working the jury, like we just mentioned, we, of course, know how Ewell bought himself a vote from Adam by making yeah. a deal to do what the I-24 already planned to do. Mm -hmm. That was another great strategy at his part, seeding mm -hmm. the jury with people who would vote for him. Yeah. And the fact that that played out as well as it did, even when it was brought up in the final tribal council and he was able to deflect it and not let Adam really. I mean, I, I've already mentioned that, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think at that point it was too late for Adam to be convinced right. otherwise. So it was it was very interesting that he was able to kind of maintain that information until the final tribal. And then all of a sudden it came out, which I thought was, that was great strategy mm -hmm. on Yule's part to kind of control that information. Yeah. Now, as for Ozzy, I asked him what his strategy was for handling the jury. He said he was trying to get his message across because he didn't have any of his original tribe on the jury. And most of the people there, he didn't have any relationship with. Mm. Now, that's the problem. Right. Why didn't he have any relationship with them? Right. Now, you talked about Brad earlier. Fine. He had no control over that. But just about everyone else there, you know, this is a strategic social game. Mm -hmm. We already noted how he missed a lot of the strategy. Sounds like he missed the social, too. You know, Ozzy added to me, Yule is such a is such a strong competitor in the social aspect. Like I said, I think I spent a little too much time doing all the classic survival things and not making sure I had that one extra vote. Yeah, th there's a lot of time lost when you're fishing. Yeah, if you're out there. There's a lot of time lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he was it's not just that he wasn't playing strategically. He wasn't playing socially either. Yeah. I mean, and I think that he's likable, obviously. I mean, he's, right. he's clearly somebody that people got along with and he, he maintained his composure. And we only mm -hmm. saw the one issue with Candace when it came to the food. So clearly very likable and he's feeding them. So that's a, an added component. But he's not trying to become anything more to these people other than a provider yeah. and someone who's like fine to have around camp. Like he doesn't make it uncomfortable and he doesn't make you feel you know, strange and he doesn't say we're, you know, he was just kind of just kind of there and everything like was fine, but he mm -hmm. wasn't really trying to formulate and build those bonds like you need. Right. Right. All right. So we've made it through the rules. It's time to wrap things up, but what are your final thoughts? All right. Listen, I did this already once, I think, because we talked about you all previously. On one of our, like, I don't know, it was like we had like episode six of something or whatever. And like, oh, when we talked about when Cowboy and it was someone his else voodoo, was his, out. Yeah, his voodoo, plan voodoo. yeah, the, plan yes, voodoo. Plan voodoo. Yes. And I mentioned this. Look, I had my pencil, which I could not find earlier. <laughs> no one's going to understand that, but you know what I'm talking about. I do. I do. You do. So here's the thing. I, and I'm I'm going to focus on Yule for a second. Uh, well, actually, I'll start with I'll start with Oscar because I do think that Oscar is someone that we we've, we've had the opportunity to see come in and play Survivor again, right? And we've seen the same Oscar each time he's played this game, and the guy is truly impressive. He his ability to win challenges, catch fish, live in the jungle and be like the jungle book is really quite incredible. I'm surprised he wasn't speaking to animals while he was out there because this is who Oscar is. And I, I think it's fitting that he did so well this season and got so far just because this was still early survivor. I, I mean, kind of right. I mean, we're at season mm -hmm. 13. So like that survival component is still a thing and not that it's, not anymore, but it's really not as significant as it was then. And so I do think that he did an awesome job in the survival aspect of it. He did an okay job with the rest of the game because clearly he made it all the way to the end. But unfortunately, as we were told, you know, when you're sitting next to another giant, there has to be things that distinguish you. And while he had those things that distinguished him, it didn't distinguish the gameplay. It distinguished him as a person and his abilities to live on an island and how he could survive. But he was forgetting what the 
most crucial component of Survivor is, and that is outwit and outplay. It's not just out survive and out fish and out win challenges. You have to do those other things. And so unfortunately, I think Oscar, Ozzy, whoever you want to call him, will always be that Ozzy, right? He'll always be that guy who's like, I can go on an island and I will I will live forever. Mm -hmm. He should be on that other game show. What is it? Lost? That's what he should do. Because he would survive. That's yeah. all it is. Like, that's what Lost is all. It's like, I think it's called Lost. Well, Lost was a drama. No, the what is it? Alone? Is it called Alone? Oh, I don't Maybe know. Maybe it's, I don't know. I don't Needless remember. to say, there's a different show he should be on and he would yeah. win. So, but I have serious respect for him. As for Becky, I feel bad that Becky decided to align herself with someone like Yule, even though it worked to her benefit and it was a, a really great game move at the beginning. By the time it got to the end, it was like a lost cause. You know, there's no there's no fighting Yule. Yule is the epitome of a human being. And this is what we're going to talk about. I'm I'm telling you, like he is just he is like a walking God as far as I'm concerned. It's just, wow. Well, and this is where this comes from. I'm sorry, I'm ranting. This is going to take a little while, but hang in there, people, because this is what <laughs> this is what Survivor Wiki does to you. Okay, so I have to set the stage right. I'm watching Survivor. Right, hmm. my daughter walks in. My daughter's 18 years old. Okay, can you believe that? She's 18. So she walks in, and she sees Yule on the screen, and she goes, "Wow." <laughs> I mean, just like oh. she's like, that's he's and she said she was that is a specimen. And I was like, yeah, you think that's a lot. Check this out. And she's like, what? And I get on my phone and I pull this up and I read this to her. So this is his backstory that um, it talks about where he was raised and that he attended high school in Northgate High in Walnut Creek, California, where he played varsity water polo and track and graduated valedictorian. Quan then attended Stanford University and obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Symbolic Systems, Theoretical Computer Science. While at Stanford, he received the James Lyon Award for service, attended Officer Candidate School for the U.S. Marine Corps, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Quan went on to receive his Juris Doctor degree from Yale Law School, where he served on the editorial board of the Yale Law Journal. Quan has enjoyed a diverse career straddling both the private and public sectors in law, business, and technology. He practiced a mix of litigation, appellate, transactional, and regulatory work at several law firms. Law firms. He has also served as a judicial clerk to a federal judge on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Additionally, he worked as a legislative aide to Senator Joseph Lieberman in Washington, D.C., where he helped draft sections of the Homeland Security Bill and other technologically related legislation. Several years ago, Quan decided to switch careers and become a management consultant at McKinsey. From there, he joined Google's business strategy group and most recently went back into consulting. Quan's favorite hobbies include politics, boxing, ultimate fighting, and volunteering with kids. He describes himself as idealistic, compassionate, and ambitious. He became passionate about creating awareness for more minority bone marrow don donors in the U.S. after launching a major search to find a match for his best friend who was diagnosed with leukemia but ultimately succumbed to the disease. Quan is a member of the Washington, D.C. and California State Bar Associations. He is also a member of the Lambda Phi Epsilon Fraternity, and he currently resides in California. And to top it all off, his birthday is February 14th, 1995. <laughs> like, I mean, Valentine's Day? Are you kidding me? Like, he. I don't even think that included everything because I think he also worked for Facebook. Yes, this was. I this think was, uh, yes. didn't, I thought he worked in the Obama administration too. He probably did, and he's got a million dollar check. So I'm sorry, but he is like, who is this walking robotic human being that like just? I read this to my daughter, and she was like, "A what? Like, are you kidding me?" So you will won because he is just everything that you could ever want in another human being. And besides the fact that he can take off his shirt and have a six pack like that. I mean, that should be in his bio here too. So yeah. And listen, I realize that was a rant, but really, I mean, this, this man did such a great job at taking all of the things that he has working for him that could also work against him and turned it into a great survivor game. And I know that people claim that, well, the idol really kept him in the game. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. 
we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. He managed the best way to use that idol in a mechanism that would keep him in the game because he could have just kept it a secret, gotten his name written down, played the idol, and then guess what? It doesn't matter anymore. He didn't do that. So he really did have the ability to take all of the information that was surrounding him and figure out the best way to get to the game that he wanted in the end. Nobody else but Yule, but make it appear as if everybody was doing this together. Kudos to the game he played. And my goodness, he's got a great resume. So Yule, you are truly an amazing human being. He's probably like a guardian of the galaxy or something. I don't know. But I, whatever his superpower is, I would like it because, wow, it's very impressive. So that's my thoughts on Yule. Okay. Well, this may be the first time ever that your conclusion is longer than what mine will be. <laughs> I know. I was like, when I printed this, I was like, that's going to be a lot. But I, people need to hey, people need to know this. That's right. All right. In, in his pregame interview, Dalton Ross asked Yule why he would win the game. And Ewell's answer was very prophetic. Uh, as Dalton later pointed out in the post-game Survivor Live show, Ewell said, Survivor requires a combination of physical skill, mental fortitude, and the ability to socially navigate. I think I have the different components you need in the right combination to be successful. I think I'm a pretty decent athlete. Mentally, I think I'm good at puzzle solving. And I can relate to different types of people who are not part of the mainstream. I think I can leverage my skills and experiences and hopefully win with a little bit of luck. That's pretty close to what happened. Right? That is the yeah. spot on what happened. Yeah. When Penner cast his final He's vote, a mind reader too. Yes. Well, future teller. Yes. There you go. Um, when Penner cast his final vote, he said, Yule outplayed you all. Rebecca said Yule was flawless strategically, Ozzy flawless in challenges. Unfortunately, she ended up voting the wrong way for the one who was flawless in challenges, but her point was still correct about both. <laughs> Ozzy was flawless in challenges, but he had plenty of flaws in the rest of the game. Ozzy did some things very well. He was a challenge phenomenon. He caught more food than anybody, and the alliance he was in made it all the way to the final four. But as I've noted, Ozzy himself admitted to the fatal flaw, emphasizing survival skills mm -hmm. over survivor skills. By not playing either the strategic game or the social game consistently throughout the season, Ozzy left out key components. I will remind you, I've said many times that Ozzy can never win Survivor. Um, sometimes people will hear me say this and they'll, they'll want to argue. And they'll they'll say they'll point to the season and say, well, he only lost by one vote. And that one vote was because of Adam's promise. OK, fine. But you really just proved my point. His first season and early season was his best chance. Yeah. At that time, food providing and challenges were still considered important. There was still that rule in my rules. It's mm -hmm. not there now. The reason it's not there is because it fell away. Right. It's not considered important. Some of the jurors were upset that they'd been outplayed so badly. Okay. That's why they voted for him. And he still lost. Yeah. Even with all this going for him. If someone wants to complain about Adam's vote, that just shows how smart Yule was to make sure he took credit and earned that vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we know from some of our prior special podcasts that scheming and plotting doesn't win every season, but it still remains the most important aspect of the game. Mm -hmm. Winning challenges, as Ozzy did, certainly is another important aspect that can get a person to the finals. But we've also discussed how one false move could doom that player. In this case, it didn't. But they were questioned he was questioned on what they what he did other than challenges right that's where ozzy found himself some of his skills cannot be denied but the missing links in his game were also the most important parts meanwhile those missing pieces of ozzy's game were where you will excelled 
as he played the outwit part of the game better than anybody else this season. And I would say better than the vast majority of anyone in any other season as well. Hmm. He did it without making too many enemies, without becoming the victim. I'm sorry, the villain um, or the victim, but the villain. He only won by one vote. And some people are like, oh, people who only win by one vote, they're not as good. No, that's you only need to get the majority. Mm -hmm. You can you can lose all the other ones. You need the majority. And the votes that he did receive were well earned. That was what he needed. Despite his protests to the contrary, Yule was the puppet master, telling his allies that they were all in it together while thinking of himself, the future and planning his path to the million dollars. And that is why you will won. So that could be his uh, superhero name. He could just be the puppet master. The puppet master. That sounds more like a villain, though. It does, though. It really does sound like a villain. We'll work on that, Yule. Yeah, promise. that's right. <laughs> Give us a ring. We'll work on it. We'll work on that. You know, yeah. we got we'll time. We'll workshop it. Yeah. yeah, we got time. No yeah. problem. All right. Well, let me remind everyone that the rules we just discussed are available as a poster. That's right. And... Right over there. A whoops, hold on, it's upside down. A t shirt mm -hmm. and another t shirt that's a checklist and a mug for the checklist. Uh, so again, go to uh, robhasawebsite.com or robhasapodcast.com for the t shirts or the mug. Click on the merch link for the poster. Go to tinyurl.com slash David Rules Poster 2. <laughs> and if you live outside of the United States, I've mentioned this before, you can DM me. Through Twitter, there I am down at the bottom there, Jessica Lewis 89, and I can make arrangements to get that to you. Yes. Now, as we wrap up, I want to encourage people to check out the RHAP patron program at robhaswebsite.com slash patron. We just started a new month, so it's the perfect time to join. Yes, and if you're already a patron, don't stop listening right now. Okay, don't tune us out. Because there's a special promotion this month where a current patron can refer a new patron. And you both get some swag. Ooh, so, nice. Yeah. So, you know, make sure if you're already a patron and you like, you know, tune out as, as I start reading this stuff. No, no, no. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, once someone who's not a patron joins, they get so much out of the patron program because there's so much, so many different ways to have fun and interact. Patron Family Feud, Patron Mafia. Right now, as we're recording this, I am missing the patron uh, discord of Survivor South Africa's first episode of uh, the new season. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's also obviously a patron only follow up podcast for each Survivor season in the countdown. Um, and Rob still has the monthly patron call in shows, weekly Q&A show with Nicole, etc. Of course, there's also the Facebook groups to keep you occupied with a great community, mm -hmm. uh, including both of us, where you could talk about Survivor, Big Brother, life in general. So again, remember to go to robhazardwebsite.com slash patron. Once you get to the Facebook groups, make sure to say hello. You should. And you should also follow us on Twitter. I am at Jessica Lewis 89. As I pointed out previously, here I am down there. And he is at David Bloomberg. You should follow us both. Get both like, sides of the yeah. story. Right there, you I'm got pointing, it. Well, see, I'm right next to Yule's face, so I don't want to cover up Yule's face on my I know. Shirt. It's hard with it being backwards. But, yes, yeah, so. so you should follow us both. And uh, Survivor, by the way, it's coming back. And when it does, we like to live tweet during the episode. So if you follow us both, you'll get to see all of that. And there seems to be this odd phenomenon. I don't know if you have just rubbed off on me too much, but, like, where we end up tweeting the same thing, like – basically at the same time during mm. the episodes. And then it becomes like a fight of who tweeted it first, which is always me, which is always it's me. Always you. You just it's make, always you know, you make stuff up. It's not true. I make stuff up and the timestamp <laughs> verifies it. Yes. Can't listen, whatever. Listen. Mm. Um, so anywho, you should follow us both because when that happens, you can get involved in the fight that causes between and you can us. Be on the right side by supporting me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> So I'm at Jessica Lewis 89 and he's at David Bloomberg. Yes. Now I've also been mentioning the newer social media outlet clubhouse, uh, which now has opened up to Android users. I know I got to get on that. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find me there also as at David Bloomberg. There's an RHAP club. Uh, I have invitations I can give out. So if you need one, hit me up on social media. 
Look at that. On Twitter. That's right. You can hit me up on Twitter <laughs> about Clubhouse. Um, the hashtag, of course, have, as we've been doing for these, is hashtag YU01. And, of course, there's the hashtag for this podcast overall, YX Lost. That's right. Um, everyone should make sure you're subscribed to all of the RHAP Survivor podcasts at robhasapodcast.com slash survivor or on your favorite podcatcher. We are, of course, also on the reality TV Rehap Ups feed. In both places, you can find a, a wide variety of great content, including, of course, the Survivor Season Countdown. And we would like to say thank you to Scott St. Pierre, who does all of the editing for us here on the Why Blank Loss podcast. So thank you, Scott St. Pierre, for not only the work that you do for us, but for RHAP and as a whole. I mean, it's incredible. And then also to Will from America, thank you for the incredible theme song that you've created for us. We appreciate it greatly. It's very catchy. And I hope that you will watch, sing the song, get involved, buy a poster, all these great things. So thank you, everyone, for that. And thank you, David, for allowing me to go a little bit above and beyond on my final words in regards to you all. But that your, needed to your be. your Yule worship? I, listen, come on. I mean, he his wife is beautiful too. I mean, everything about this guy, it's like win, win, win. Just keeps checking those boxes. I, yeah. th it's incredible. And not that he hasn't earned it. The guys work incredibly hard. So yes, that thank you for that, David. I appreciate yes. it. Yes, yes. Well, and thank you for joining me once again to talk Survivor. Um I, I, everybody who's listening and watching, it'll probably be couple few weeks before our next one again um but keep your eyes and ears open for when that happens so we will see everyone again soon for the next look at why somebody won bye everybody bye